I think it was the most marvelous looking ship I've ever seen. Massive, 50,000 tons, but also beautiful. And we realized that she had to be destroyed. Beautiful as she may have been. Admiral Tovey's plan was for the Rodney to take the lead and draw Bismarck's fire, while the King George would keep the distance and fire plunging shots onto Bismarck's decks. Once the Bismarck was fully engaged, the heavy cruisers would come in range and add their firepower to the battle. Because the Rodney had the thickest armour, it was felt that she was best placed to withstand Bismarck's firepower. At 08.43, the Bismarck was sighted coming out of a rain squall. The Rodney opened fire first, followed by the King George V one minute later. At a distance of 20,000 metres, the Bismarck returned fire with her two forward turrets against the Rodney. Her rear turrets could not be trained on target for a while due to her inability to manoeuvre. A few minutes later, the heavy cruiser Norfolk joined the battle with her 8-inch guns. The Rodney had been firing for about 16 minutes when she finally got the range. The Bismarck was hit by several shells. At 5 past 9, the heavy cruiser Dorsetshire arrived on the scene to add her fire power. At 0908, the Bismarck was hit by a devastating salvo from the Rodney, which hit the roof of B turret towards the back. This destroyed B turret and cut the hydraulic power to A turret. The explosion blasted into the bridge, killing or wounding everyone there, and put the forward rangefinder out of action. The Bismarck's fire control was therefore shifted to the rear rangefinder. But at 0913, this was also put out of action by a 14-inch shell. The rear turrets then proceeded to fire under less effective local control. Noting the sporadic, ineffective fire being directed towards her, the Rodney closed the distance, bringing her secondary armaments into play while also increasing her accuracy. At 0931, Bismarck fired her last 15-inch salvo. Only a few secondary guns were still in action, but these were soon silenced by the enormous avalanche of British fire. Once the Bismarck's guns had gone silent, Rodney moved in for the kill. From a distance of 3,000 metres, Rodney battered the Bismarck at point-blank range with her nine 16-inch guns. Once the port side had been wrecked and on fire from stem to stern, the Rodney manoeuvred to Bismarck's starboard side to continue the carnage. The two ships were so close that the British sailors could see what was happening on board the Bismarck. So we saw this little trickle of men run down across the full quarter deck and jump into the sea. And that was a very eerie sight because suddenly the human side had entered into it. And we realized what an appalling carnage we were causing on board. At 0956, the Rodney launched her last two torpedoes from a distance of 2,700 meters. The previous six fired from a greater distance, having all missed. One hit the armoured belt, which gave the Rodney the distinction of being the only battleship in history to have successfully torpedoed another battleship. Despite the appalling destruction inflicted on her superstructure, only two shells penetrated the armoured belt. The Bismarck's thick armour, combined with a honeycomb of armoured bulkheads, gave her excellent flotation characteristics. Inside the Bismarck, Carl had come to a decision. We have to get out of here, out of this witch's cauldron, out of this death hole and up to the top. As I got out of there, I saw things that I did not think possible. The turrets were ripped open like a tulip. 
I could see inside. Everything was on fire. There were explosions. There were about 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 dead. Some of them without legs, without arms, without heads. Our lieutenant was there. He had lost both legs. And he asked me if I had a cigarette. It was so hard, you can't even imagine. I gave him a cigarette and promised him that if I was saved, I would deliver a message to his family. Joannes and some of his shipmates left the boiler room and made their way onto the deck. Then a hit came in the alleyway. I saw our first officer and our division officer killed. The bomb ripped the two of them apart into pieces. I used force to squeeze the hatch to the top open, and we came out on the starboard side. The first thing I saw was a pile of butchered meat. I say butchered meat on purpose. You couldn't distinguish between a man's arm, leg, or any remaining pieces. From time to time, half of a head. It was horrendous. Ammunition was exploding. The entire upper deck was on fire. It looked like a heap of rubble. The beauty of the ship was gone. On board the King George, Admiral Tovey, observing the devastation on board the Bismarck, had seen enough. At 10.16, he ordered a ceasefire. Being short on fuel, he directed the Dorsetshire to finish her off with torpedoes, while the home fleet would make its way back to port. Despite being ablaze from stem to stern, the Bismarck refused to sink. The senior officer still alive made the decision to abandon the ship and put her out of her misery by ordering the scuttling of the Bismarck. Joseph recalled, Yes, we would have sunk, but it would have taken a lot longer. When the order was given to abandon ship, all the valves were open. We flooded the ship. We also ignited special scuttling bombs. The Dorsetshire closed the range and fired two torpedoes at Bismarck's starboard side, which, due to Bismarck listing to port, acted as counter-flooding. So the Dorsetshire moved over to the Bismarck's port side to launch her remaining torpedoes. A sailor on board the Dorsetshire noted that The Bismarck was stopped, completely stopped, and she was on fire from stem to stern. It was incredible that it was still afloat. By the time the Dorsetshire launched her last torpedoes, the Bismarck's list to port was so severe that the torpedoes hit her decks. With the blood making the decks slippery and the increasing list to port, it was becoming increasingly difficult to move. Steadily listing due to having been hit by six torpedoes and over 400 shells, the scuttling by the crew considerably hastened her demise. the Bismarck capsized and began to sink. Of the 2,249 crew, less than a thousand made it into the water alive. As the Bismarck began her three-mile journey to the bottom of the ocean, the armoured bulkheads which had protected the hundreds still on board from the inferno on deck now became the two. She would stay in one piece and landed on the bottom in an upright position. An hour after the sinking, the Dorsetshire and the Mori began to pick up survivors from the water. Within minutes, the rescue was abandoned. A survivor recalled, The water round Dorsetshire's stern foamed and bubbled with the sudden exertion of the screws. Slowly, then faster, the ship moved ahead. Bismarck survivors who were almost on board were bundled over the guardrails onto the deck. Those halfway up the ropes found themselves trailing astern, 
hung on as long as they could against the forward movement of the ship, dropped off one by one. Others in the water clawed frantically at the paintwork as the sides slipped by. In Dorsetshire they heard the thin cries of hundreds of Germans who had come within an inch of rescue and believed that their long ordeal was at last over. Cries that the British sailors, no less than survivors already on board, would always remember. From the water, Bismarck's men watched appalled as the cruiser's grey sides swept past them, presently found themselves alone in the sunshine on the empty, tossing sea. And during the day, as they floated about the Atlantic with only lifebelts between them and eternity, the cold came to their hands and feet and heads, and one by one they lost consciousness, and one by one they died. The reason given for the abandoning of the survivors to their fates was the sighting of a U-boat. But this was impossible. German documents showed that the closest U-boat was U-74, which would take nine hours to get to the sinking location. U-74 finally arrived at the site of the smack sinking at eight o'clock that evening. Of the estimated 800 abandoned survivors, only three would be found alive. Only 115, less than 5% of the crew, would survive the sinking. The question runs through my head all the time. Why did Captain Martin stop the rescue while so many hundreds of men were still in the water? I can only interpret it as an act of revenge for what happened to the hood. No more than teenagers back then. Now, at the end of their lives, the remaining survivors still meet to remember their comrades. The physical scars have long since healed, but the mental scars they'll take with them to the grave. The events that happened there, they will never go away. They just won't. What I saw, you might be able to mask it, but you can never never completely forget it. These mountains of corpses, the body parts, it was unbelievable. Gruesome. Gruesome. It is sometimes difficult <coughs> to be reminded all the time. It's hard to explain. On one hand, you are glad you survived. But then you are pulled back into the past again. Subscribe and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you don't miss the next video.